my task this evening is to talk about coronaviruses. Um, when I saw the topic, I was, I was wondering how I would speak publicly about a virus that has now become a scourge. So um, I went back to some of my lecture notes for, for some of the students and, and thought that we would, you know, do a simple version so that um, people who are not scientists, I know I'm speaking to people who are also in the field of arts, as well as the scientists who would um, probably live with a better understanding of the virus and our pursuit of vaccines to control this new virus. So can we have the next slide, please? <clears throat> I will do it myself, okay. What does it point? This way? This is forward. This one forward. Okay, so the structure of my talk this evening will be very simple. I'll try and tell you what coronaviruses are, why this group of, um, why this respiratory virus is a major public health threat. It, it is actually a pandemic. And we will talk specifically about uh, what we know about COVID-19. And then we'll end with, with um, some information on the types of vaccine. And I will tell you about some of the work we've done in Ghana on coronaviruses. So, we know that the coronaviruses belong to the group of common respiratory viruses. Some of these respiratory viruses are the rhinoviruses, the influenza viruses, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, and the adenovirus group. So they are associated with the symptoms that you find listed. Of course, the influenza virus is one of the uh, most talked about virus because it's associated with severe illness across the Atlantic in the Western Hemisphere during the winter season. Before the advent of COVID-19, uh, pandemic influenza was the feared, dreaded disease of public health importance. And I must say that the scientists always say when, not if, there will be another influenza pandemic. And most of the resources that have been devoted towards tackling COVID-19 have actually come from the preparedness for influenza that has been set up because influenza has always been seen to be a potential a global health threat. Now, these respiratory viruses affect the upper and lower respiratory tract. So this is to show you that when the viruses enter through the nose or the mouth, and then they affect the lungs the, through the bronchitis. And then the presentation, when you have lower respiratory diseases, of course, the, the clinicians will tell you, it usually manifests as pneumonia. That's when it gets to the uh, lower respiratory tract. And we have a whole range of viruses that are associated with respiratory illness. These are listed, as you can see, that affect the upper respiratory tract, the rhinovirus, coronavirus, influenza virus, foreign influenza virus, RSV, the herpes virus, adenovirus, and even the Coxsackie virus group as well. And then the lower respiratory tract, we have influenza still going down there. We have adenovirus, Boca virus, and the metaminovirus. So actually, when a clinician is presented with respiratory infection, the symptoms, there's actually a whole range of viruses that the virologist can test for when you know, the sample is sent to the lab. And our key focus now, or our main suspicion now, is that when we see somebody with respiratory distress, it's most likely to be COVID. But that is not the case. We could have several other viruses that may have uh, prostrated the, the symptoms that present in the consulting room. Actually, when you actually find severe acute respiratory illness, most of the time it has progressed to a secondary bacterial infection. And you find that it's actually very difficult sometimes to determine which was the 
viral pathogen that was associated with the initial uh, infection. Um, we do know before the advent of, uh, of COVID-19 that the coronaviruses accounted for about one third to one half of the acute respiratory infections in humans. And most of these infections were mild. People would hardly report to uh, a consulting room or go on admission with a common cold virus like the rhinovirus. We would rarely have influenza being one of the viruses that would result in severe acute respiratory infection resulting in admission to a hospital. Now, the coronaviruses have been with us for some time. They're actually first identified in the mid 1960s and they are named according to the crown-like spikes on their surface. There are four main groups of the coronaviruses, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And we know of seven types that can infect humans. And I'll show you that we've actually found human coronaviruses in Ghana way before the uh, SARS-CoV-2 was identified from China and has become the present uh, pandemic. So it, it's, it's not a new infection in Ghana. The coronaviruses have been around with us, even in Ghana, uh, for some time, but have never been associated with death or severe illness that we see uh, currently. Uh, the common human coronaviruses are actually four types, and they belong to the alpha and the beta group. They've been named with numbers, and I would not you know, worry you to remember these numbers, just to remember that, yes, we have two groups of human coronaviruses, the alpha and beta, and these are in existence in Ghana now as I speak. The other coronaviruses have actually been the ones of, of severe public health interest because they've been associated with, with severe disease. We have the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. We have the severe acute respiratory uh, uh, syndrome, the first one, and then of course, the 2019 novel coronaviruses that causes COVID-19. So these coronaviruses have not been new to us. However, because of the advent of of uh, 2019, the novel coronavirus, uh, this has become unprecedented in the history of, of mankind. I, I've never known an airline to stop flying because of an influenza virus, but we have had severe global disruptions because of the, of, of the coronavirus. And we're all sitting here wearing masks. I think before COVID-19, no clinician would would wear a mask giving to, 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 to manage a TB patient. In fact, one of the strategies we adopted for managing suspected avian influenza cases in humans was to put a surgical mask on the patient and put him, to, put him into some isolation room until the tests were, were, were conducted. But um, COVID has completely changed our perception of, of, of respiratory illness. And now we are even afraid of these uh, alpha and beta viruses that are not associated with severe disease. Can we correct the PowerPoint? Okay. So, as I mentioned, because these respiratory viruses cause such, present such a global threat, we, we, we've noted that although the normal occurrence of these viruses is associated with manageable infections, when there is a new virus that emerges because of what we call, I don't want to use the big scientific words, usually we refer to it as shifts and drifts because of mutations of the, of the viruses. When these new viruses emerge or new variants or strains emerge, the human population is therefore at risk of, of severe disease because of lack of immunity to the new strain or the new variant. So we have had, we have paid attention to to known threats such as the avian influenza virus, because these viruses usually persist in, 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 in animal hosts, in, in birds, and when they cross over to humans, we have experienced um, as severe outbreaks and, and pandemics. So before the advent of COVID-19, the scientific community were working on the assumption that we would have a global pandemic, which would be caused by one of these avian influenza viruses. But this unfortunately has not been the case, and we've rather suffered this global pandemic from a coronavirus, the 2019 novel uh, coronavirus. 
But I should remind you that this is not strange because in 2002, we actually had the first transmission of a coronavirus which affected parts of Asia. Actually, it was uh, also originated in, in, in Guangdong and uh, it moved to Hong Kong. And actually it, it, it enabled the establishment of the Public Health Agency of Canada because of the severe infections and disruption to, to, to human health, public health that, that, that occurred at that time. And it was due to the first SARS virus, which was associated with transmission from a civet uh, cats, raccoon dogs in the live game market in, in, in China. So COVID-19, the, 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 the transmission of, 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 of a respiratory virus to cause such disease in humans has this precedence in, in what happened in 2002. And actually there were investigations by, by WHO, uh, actually the, the scientists who, who determined the etiology of this virus actually died uh, in March, unfortunately. And this virus spread and caused a lot of disruption especially uh, throughout Asia. And, and SARS was a very feared uh, respiratory pathogen uh, subsequently. At that time, of course, WHO issued a global health threat and also a travel advisory to the affected uh, area. The other one that is of interest also is the Middle East Respiratory uh, uh, Syndrome Coronavirus. This was identified in Saudi Arabia in the Middle East in 2012. And the symptoms that uh, presented were, were severe pneumonia, uh, resulting in a case fatality rate of about 35%. Uh, and to date, 858 human cases, human fatal cases have occurred. This virus has been found in 27 countries. And luckily, unlike COVID-19, unlike SARS-CoV-2, there has been no sustained human-to-human -human transmission. This virus has not established itself in the human community. It has been associated with transmission from camels to humans, and we pray that it remains uh, so. There have been some limited outbreaks in healthcare settings, and you can see from um, uh, this map that the main uh, spread has just been out from, um, from, from the Middle East. There have been some cases in Korea uh, reported previously, but uh, the cases have, have remained uh, low. And we have less than 1,000 people who have died from, from Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. We have done some uh, uh, work on, 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 on this virus because each year when the Hajj pilgrimage has taken place, there has been the fear that pilgrims could return with uh, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. So uh, the Ghana Health Service and the Ministry of Health, uh, Noguchi and the KCCR, we have done some screening of returning Hajj pilgrims in 2014, 2015, 2016, when resources were available, and we did not find that any of these Hajj pilgrims returned with the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. We have done some further uh, screening for people with uh, respiratory illness, and we continue to find the absence of this virus in Ghana. However, again, maybe this is somewhere, something that the academy could, you know, uh, could remind government about the importance of allocating sufficient resources to the scientific community so that we do keep screening for these viruses and not just the current focus only on the SARS-CoV-2 because we will have the pilgrims resuming their trips to, to, to Mecca during when the uh, pandemic uh, subsides. And despite this uh, focus on COVID-19 vaccination, we still have the threat from MERS-CoV uh, still uh, over us. So this is just to show the work that we've done uh, previously on screening returning pilgrims in the uh, Hajj camp across at the uh, airport. Area. Now, COVID-19. When SARS-CoV-2 was first reported from, from, from China, there was the suggestion that the virus had jumped from animal species uh, uh, in the wet market to humans. And Recently, this issue has come up. So I decided to start with this slide to explain that yes, the discussion about the origin of the virus is truly important. Because if we know the source, we'll be able to prevent future reintroduction of the same virus into the uh, human population. And you find that at the end of uh, this talk, why am I saying that that is important? Also, if the theory is that the virus 
jump from bats into humans, and therefore we'll be able to prevent, this is theoretical because I don't see how, we know we have a lot of bats across at 37, and I think it will be very, very uh, difficult to, to actually manage the natural movement of bats. I recall that uh, when my grandfather, this is my great grandfather, I have to be careful, he was in admission at the hospital, that's when the bats were supposed to have migrated from a grove in Chebi. Uh, to the present settlement at, at the uh, 37 hospital. So we think that um, we will be able to understand how the virus moved from bats into humans. And then scientific work will also show how we can prevent similar pandemics in future because we will have details about how the original virus looked like and then we'll probably have a more efficient uh, uh, vaccine and treatments available. So these are the reasons why I think the current discussion about the origin of the, of, of the virus is important. Sometimes people look at it you know, in a political manner. Sometimes there are so many theories about um, conspiracy theories, but you will find that it has been necessary to do gain of function studies if you look at the issue of avian influenza. And so sometimes science and uh, the way it evolves is, 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 is difficult to control, but this is one event that shows the political consequences of, of, um, of uh, leaving scientists alone and not knowing what they do, but also we need to have funds for research. So it's a very uh, a difficult uh, uh, question. I, I recall that uh, 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 we have attended some conferences looking at uh, biological weapons of mass destruction. I, I remember uh, Kofi has gone to a couple of the conferences. And you find that uh, these discussions are important for us to understand so that as scientists we can continue to, to, to strive for the research uh, funding that is required. Uh, so of course, the symptoms of, 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 of COVID-19 are well known. I will not be talking about how many cases and et cetera, because that is common daily information that we all monitor from, from, from the various sources. But just to remind you that uh, the symptoms include a headache, shortness of breath, the cough, muscle pain, fever, and tiredness. And then we know that there has been loss of smell, okay? And also, some people have experienced a, 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 a funny taste, et cetera. And um, in, the, in the beginning, uh, this virus was called the, 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 the China coronavirus. Now we have also experienced long COVID, and the clinicians will be able to tell you better about this, where people who have recovered from the virus now have a, a set of symptoms, lethargy, inability to, to perform as before they, 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 they got infected with the virus. So this virus has has opened a new chapter in knowledge about, about the effects on, on humans, and we need to continue to study uh, these uh, as, as it evolves. So, of course, because this is a respiratory virus, the way we have diagnosed this in the lab is by taking respiratory specimens from both the oral and uh, nasopharynx, and these specimens are then processed, you know, in a safe environment to extract the ribonucleic acid, we know it's an RNA virus, and then we use um, uh, molecular methods for the direct detection of the fragments to identify uh, the, the, the virus. And it's good to do this in a, in a controlled environment. Of course, testing has, has improved, and now we can do direct testing for the presence of the antigen straight away without doing molecular methods. We also have improvements in antibody detection and this has been one argument that people have not understood from the beginning because you would not be able to accurately diagnose a respiratory virus using serology, which we just show that the person has been previously exposed. And we do know that before coronaviruses were, were what you could circulating. So if you did a test that was not specific enough, it would not tell you that the person actually had the SARS-CoV-2. But now the serological tests uh, and surveys are ongoing and they're showing us giving us some information about the extent of exposure because these tests have become more specific and I think that they will help us in understanding more about the viruses. So as we um, have heard from the epidemiologists, I think uh, because of COVID-19, we now understand how R0, the reproductive ability of the virus is a very important indicator. This is something that we have now used to model uh, the appropriate uh, response to, uh, uh, to, the, to, to the disease. And it's all based on understanding how many people get infected and therefore the disease spreads in the population. Again, the statisticians and the epidemiologists will be better placed uh, to explain this. But I thought it was important to show that 
when the reproduction number goes below 1.0, they say that the epidemic is likely to die out. I haven't seen influenza die out yet. So one thing that we will talk about, I'm sure at the end is uh, the notion about herd immunity and the need to vaccinate as many people as possible. But I think that this virus will not be stamped out. I think that it has come to stay and it will always be hovering around somewhere looking for susceptible individuals. And it's something that we will have to find a way to manage and not uh, think that we will be able to eradicate this virus. Um, yes, comparing this virus to some of the, of the other viruses that Kofi was telling you about uh, Ebola, uh, we know that um, if you look at the deaths reported, the crude uh, uh, fatality rates, you can see the figures uh, for how uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, 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 or 2019 novel coronavirus uh, compares uh, to, 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 to Ebola. Ebola killed on the average of 50% of the people it infected. You know, we lost close to 10,000 people in, in West Africa. And um, whereas on the average, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is just a 2% crude uh, fatality rate. I think you can calculate, we have over 98,000, close to 100,000 people who have been infected with, with, with uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in Ghana. We know that less than 1,000 have died. So if you calculate the, 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 the crude the case fatality rate, you can, you can see how uh, it, 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 how deadly the virus is in terms of the population figure. But that's the problem about looking at it as a virus. When you have COVID as an individual, I don't think you'll be interested in case fatality rate. You want to recover. If you've lost a loved one from, from COVID-19, it doesn't matter whether it's 1% or 10%. It's a loved one who is gone and will not come back. So the science is good, but uh, now I think the dilemma we have as scientists is explaining this virus that we cannot see and the effects on the community, the disruption in economic trade. And sometimes it's difficult to explain to the political authority what is the appropriate way and the evidence that is required to, to help balance and, and deal with the situation. Um, we know that um, in winter, other respiratory viruses like uh, flu, they spread fastest. But we have found in Ghana from surveillance on influenza that uh, flu persists all throughout the year. Sometimes it has gone up in the rainy season. We've done some work, uh, uh, Kofi and I, and show that in the rainy season, we seem to have more flu than in the dry season. But in the dry season, we have the Hamatan winds coming and then we have more respiratory disease generally, people with kata and other things. And so we need to do more work and see how, you know, whether truly <laughs> a dry season results in in less respiratory disease and less uh, uh, COVID. Um, one interesting thing is that with the opening of the schools, we have not seen as much COVID in the school children as in the adult population. And I think uh, the data, uh, the epidemiologists will look at this and present this uh, as they, they find more, but that's what I've seen so far from the data that we don't get uh, uh, as much. In fact, we have not had fatal cases at all in any of the schools where children have been infected, I think. That's what the data say. However, it will be interesting. Maybe um, Evelyn and Kofi, we need to look at um, whether the virus in, in children is a different variant or less uh, uh, virulent than the ones that have been found in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the adults. So um, just to contrast with the other respiratory virus, before the advent of COVID-19, we did some work on influenza to see what was the bedding of disease. We found that influenza accounted for about 9% uh, and, uh, of medically attended severe acute respiratory illness, whereas 18% of people who had influenza-like illness going to an outpatient department had, had flu. But the rates were higher in, in young children. And we realized that the advice would be that we probably needed to, to have some priority uh, uh, A for the use of influenza vaccines. Um, I did mention to you that before the advent of COVID-19, we did have human coronaviruses in, in Ghana. And the study by colleagues at KCCR, uh, they looked at acute respiratory in infection cases, and, and they found that uh, human coronaviruses did play a significant uh, role in causing upper respiratory infections amongst adults and children in rural areas in Ghana. So this paper is available, you can uh, look it up, but this is the evidence I wanted to present to you 
that before 2019, before 2020, when we all became very worried and about pandemic uh, uh, COVID-19, we actually had a human coronaviruses in Ghana, and this has been reported by our colleagues at, at KCCR. We also um, have done some work looking at especially the uh, samples we collected from the Hajj pilgrims, okay? So we looked at them, we were able to determine, uh, we found uh, human coronaviruses in about 3.5% of the cases, uh, HKU 22229E, uh, all the alpha and beta uh, coronaviruses were represented uh, in, in, in among the positive cases. We didn't find any co-infections, and the main thrust of our study at the time was looking out for the Middle East Respiratory uh, Syndrome virus, which we did not find. So far, we do not have any indication that uh, this virus is, 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 is among the Ugandan population. Now, because this is a zoonotic virus, I looked back at some of the work we had done recently, and we did a study together with the um, uh, uh, veterinary colleagues looking at uh, the possibility of a zoonotic viruses moving over from, from animals to humans. We actually did this work in the part of the Brongahafu region in the monkey sanctuary. So we tried to find out if there were new and uh, unknown uh, viruses of epidemic and pandemic potential, uh, which were associated with probably uh, livelihoods, you know, farmers, hunters. Okay, we actually did a study also, we actually included the Tet Seven military hospital because of the bats uh, in that uh, uh, group around there. So uh, we looked at five specific viral families, the coronavirus, influenza virus, paramyxo, filovirus, that's the Ebola group, uh, flavivirus, yellow fever, and even the arena virus. We did, you know, deep sequencing of, of, of the full sequencing of, 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 the, of the specimens. And we found that, um, uh, of course, the dominant virus we found was the influenza virus. We found some coronaviruses. We found foreign influenza viruses. We didn't find any filoviruses. And um, this was interesting because it confirmed to me or to us that before the advent of, of, of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 or the novel coronavirus, we did have, you know, coronaviruses circulating in humans. We also looked at bats and rodents in the same community. And we did find the, uh, in some of the bats, we found uh, the coronaviruses that are known to, I think uh, they're called what, Kenya bat coronavirus, and another one that I've forgotten the name. But these, but these viruses persist in bats in Ghana now. So there is that potential I've told you. Uh, so it's not just in China where probably the bats cross species. It can happen if we have more interaction uh, in our setting in Ghana. Now, vaccines. I thought I would end by just, you know, talking about uh, some of the viruses that have been, uh, uh, what you call it, developed. And um, these viruses, we tend to describe them, if you take the first two at the top, the Pfizer and Moderna are called RNA viruses because they are based on a construct that is derived from the ribonucleic acid uh, uh, conserved region of the uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then we have the AstraZeneca, the Sputnik, and the Johnson & Johnson, which depend on a viral vector to present the uh, uh, viral antigen to induce the immune response. And then the CoronaVac, the Sinopharm, and then the Covaxin, which are actually inactivated viruses that are presented to the human immune system to stimulate the immune response. And then the last one is the Novavax, which is actually a protein-based subunit that has been also uh, developed. So this is in a nutshell, just to summarize that um, there are different uh, 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 approaches to, to the development of some of these vaccines that are out on the market. And um, there have been some comparisons on, on how they were made. So the AstraZeneca is, is a viral vector, okay? We know that the Moderna and the Pfizer are RNA. Okay, and then the Sputnik is also a viral vector, just like the uh, uh, AstraZeneca. In the case of the uh, Sputnik, it's actually the adenovirus. There are two kinds of adenovirus vectors that are being used, whereas for the uh, AstraZeneca is one kind and also same for the Johnson & Johnson. And um, it affects the way that the uh, number of doses that are given and how they uh, are stored. And also 
there is now ongoing work on what we know to be the new variants, or the, I shouldn't say new, what we know about these respiratory viruses, especially influenza, is that as they evolve, we have variants emerging. And what has happened now is that there is monitoring of these variants as they emerge, and depending on the transmission and the amount of disease they cause, they are being described as a variant of concern or variants of importance. And we have just had a new um, nomenclature brought out by WHO so that uh, depending on the country of origin, they are now being called according to alpha, beta, gamma, etc. So this is an evolving uh, process. So uh, if you take the country of origin, you find the uh, variant that is named and of course the name that is, is given to it. And this is something that we are most interested in because we want to see whether there would be breakthrough variants that would affect, you know, uh, uh, the, the vaccination. I don't think I will have time to talk about, you know, the immunological aspect, which is not my area. So I just want to conclude by saying that we know that um, these novel virus infections will always uh, affect us because um, we do not have uh, the re required immunity because they are new viruses. Um, the risks will depend on the character characteristic of the, of the virus especially the ability for the virus to spread between people. That's why these uh, new variants, the Delta one from India has been found to be uh, of extreme high public health uh, concern. And also we look also at the severity of illness and that is associated with the, with, the, with the variants. And then it will affect therefore our ability to, to, to introduce 